Today we are in Nehemiah's book. We're in chapter 10 as we continue a verse-by-verse study through the book of Nehemiah. And today I want to begin, by the way, Marshall preached a tremendous message last week on chapter 9, and we talked about uh, just the period of time in history that Israel had entered when Nehemiah, when Ezra wrote the book of Nehemiah. And of course, they have come back from captivity in Babylon. They have already built the temple, the temple of Zerubbabel, and they have already completed the walls in 52 days, and the next thing that happened was Ezra the priest took out the word of God, and the people came together at the great feast, and they they stood for six hours as the word of God was read, the law of God was read. They took time in that period to allow the priests or the Levites and the heads of households to go to the people and explain what was being taught as Ezra was sharing. So this is a very moving moment. Ezra on a podium like this, and he has the scroll, and he is reading the law of God to the people, and the people are coming under conviction, so much so that they began to mourn and weep as they listened to the stories in the Scripture about how their forefathers had rebelled against God, had proved, proved, uh, proven themselves to be unfaithful to God. Even though, while they were unfaithful, God was still faithful to them. And so now we are in chapter 10, and really chapter 10 begins in the last verse of chapter 9. If you go ahead and turn to verse 38 of chapter 9, Remember this, that while the Bible is inspired by God, it is holy, it is, it, is, it is literally from the Lord. This is God's eternal word. Yet, the chapters and the verses were added later by man, so they're not inspired. So I can say that verse 38 of chapter 9 really belongs with chapter 10, and that's why I want to start there. It says in verse 38, because of all this, We make a firm covenant in writing on the sealed document are the names of our princes, our Levites, and our priests. Because of all this. Because of all what? Because of their history. How God proved himself faithful to Israel and how Israel proved themselves unfaithful to God. Because of his faithfulness to their unfaithful forefathers, They are ready to make a covenant to do better. We don't want to repeat the sins of our fathers. So we are going to make a covenant today before God. And this covenant, interestingly enough, is not established by God. It is a covenant that they are making to God. So they start by listing the names of the leaders whose signatures show up on the sealed covenant. There are four individuals or groups signing this document. Let me give you the four. I'm going to outline, really, verses 1 all the way down to verse 31 here, okay? And so the first person that seals this covenant is Nehemiah. It says right there in verse 1. He's the governor. So the governor, Nehemiah, he signs the document. And then you have the priests, 22 of them, who signed the document. And next are the Levites, verse 9, 17 of them. And if you think for a second I'm going to try and attempt to name these guys, you got another thing coming. Uh, The last group are the chiefs of the people. Those would be the heads of households. And so all of these are the ones that are actually putting their signature on this covenant before God to keep his law. Now, the priest of Israel, let me separate priest and Levite. You might wonder, what's the difference? Remember the story, the parable Jesus told of the good Samaritan, and the priest walks by, then the Levite walks by, and neither of them helped. What's the difference? The priest of Israel were a group of qualified leaders who served at the sacrificial altar, and also they served in the inner and outer sanctum of the temple. So basically, 
They were the ones who worked within the holy place and the holy of holy place once a year. Those are the priests, okay? The Levites were tasked with the auxiliary responsibilities of the temple, like guarding the temple, providing, making sure things are where they're supposed to be, keeping things in order. So you have one group that serve in a far more spiritual sense. The other, it's more of, a, of, of just taking care of the facility. All of them have to be Levites of the Levitical tribe, okay? And you, really, to put it this way, all priests are Levites, but not all Levites are priests. That was a higher calling, okay? So now, one thing that stands out in this covenant made by the people is that there is no opposition to it. Nobody is against this covenant. Now, that's hard to believe because Israel was constantly in a state of dissension. Even when Nehemiah arrived, there were those who were planted inside the city who were stirring up the hornet's nest, Sanballat, Tobiah, and others who were from the outside, moving people on the inside to stir up the nest so that they couldn't complete the wall. Well, guess what? These folks have come a long way because they've returned to God. They put God first. So I, I want to, there's probably two reasons why they are working in unison, why they are supporting one another. Number one, uh, it's amazing what 70 years of captivity can do to turn people's hearts back to God. I think there's a point there for us, and that is that we can drift from God. We as a people can drift from God, but individually we can drift. We can go off on our own and do our own thing, and God takes a lesser position in our life, and God then allows trouble to come. God brings adversity. He is the one that oftentimes brings the, the adversity to us. Why? To get us to soften in our heart and return to him, and that's what's happened to them. Secondly, though, it's not just that they were gone for 70 years and God he softened their hearts. But number two, when they opened the Scripture and began to listen to Ezra as he shared the Scripture and they taught the Scripture, all of a sudden it revealed to them, the Scripture revealed how far they had drifted from God. That's why I say the key to our worship every Sunday, the high point, the critical moment is when we open the Word of God and we teach from the word of God and you receive from the word of God because the word is what calls you by the Holy Spirit and it brings conviction and calls you back to God. And so we never want to take a lesser stand on scripture. We will always put scripture first. We should. And, and so, so they bound themselves. But they did it first of all in a general sense and that was that they would keep the whole law. But then they decided that they would really specifically identify certain special points of the law that they know they themselves, forget about the forefathers, they themselves had violated certain passages. And so for the rest of chapter 10, they hit these three areas where they have violated the law. What I love about that is the word of God was proclaimed they came into understanding, and it says that everybody who had understanding listened. That means children were listening because they were, it was being explained to them. And after they had it explained to them, the word of God, they came under conviction. Now, all of a sudden, they're wanting to get right with God. They're wanting to line up with a God who loves them and has been faithful to them, and even though they... Uh, rejected God, turned from God, he was still faithful to them. That hit their hearts hard and heavy, and now they're coming to him and they're turning. So, very important here. Look at verse 28, if you will. It says, the rest of the people, the priests, the Levites, the gatekeepers, the singers, the temple servants, and all who have separated themselves from the peoples of the land to the law of God. They separated themselves from the world, and they separated themselves to be about the word of God, to be the people of God. Their wives, their sons, their daughters, 
all who have knowledge and understanding. They joined with their brothers, their nobles, and entered into a curse and an oath to walk in God's law that was given by Moses, the servant of God, and to observe and do all the commandments of the Lord, our, our Lord, uh, and his rules and his statutes. They were so serious about their covenant to return to God that they said, let this not just be an oath of blessing, let this be an oath of curse. If we don't do it, Lord, we know that you'll curse us for it. We'll suffer because of it. So yes, as we obey your word, bless us. But if we choose not to obey or we turn and we disobey, Lord, we're, we know that it, a curse is on its way. Now, covenants in the Old Testament were always established with blood. You go all the way back to the beginning when Adam and Eve sinned and God came in the cool of the day in the Garden of Eden to have fellowship with Adam. After they sinned, they were hiding. And God said, where are you, Adam? Adam shows up, and he and Eve have covered themselves with fig leaves because it came to their full recognition after they ate of the tree of knowledge of good and evil that they were sinners. So they covered their shameful parts, the parts that they knew that sin would attack. God said, that's not good enough for me. So God had animals that he killed, and he gave them skins of animals to cover themselves. The blood had to be shed because of sin. Scripture says without the shedding of blood, there is no remission for sin. So in the Old Testament, whenever you see a covenant, know that there was bloodshed. When Abraham when God made covenant with Abraham, Abraham took animals, doves, split them in half, made an offering before God, a sacrifice. Blood had to be shed. It was called the cutting of the blood. If you wanted to have a covenant with God, there had to be the cutting of the blood. That was the covenant. It was in blood. And these people are no different. They have animals that they are sacrificing as they make this covenant before God. And so here in verse 28 and 29, we see that they are making that commitment to God. Now, now there are several specific things that they know they've sinned in and they want to change. And so this is added into the covenant, and it begins at verse 30. But I'm going to share with you three points here quickly. Number one, go ahead and write these down so you have them. The first one is, we will honor God in choosing a spouse. That's verse 28 through 30. We will honor God in choosing a spouse. Number two, we will keep God in our business dealings. Verse 31. And then the last point, we will be faithful to give to the work of of the Lord. That's verses 32 through 39. So let's go ahead and begin with, with the first point, and that is we will honor God in choosing a spouse for our children. Verse 30, we will not give our daughters to the peoples of the land or take their daughters for our sons. Now the system that Israel used in their culture, in their custom, was that the parents arranged the marriages. How excited are you young people who are getting married to hear that, huh? Uh, that your parents pick and choose who you will marry. We can hang up and say, well, that was the first problem they had was that they let the parents pick. Uh, I'm going to give you a little, a little uh, you know, kickback. I'm going to tell you that's not the problem. The problem isn't whether the child should choose their own spouse or the parents should choose the spouse for the child. That's not the issue. Both systems can work. There are many civilizations on the earth today, the culture is the parents choose the kids to marry, and those marriages last. Don't you think that if parents were the ones that God called us to have choose the spouse for our kids, 
Do you not think that God could take those two kids and he could so weave them together that they have a tremendous marriage in the Lord if they keep their focus on him? Of course he, they could. So that's not the issue. The issue is, who are you choosing as parents for your child? Who are you choosing as a child that's now of an adult age that you can get married? Who have you chosen as your spouse? That's the real issue. And that's where they broke the law of God. The parents were actually giving their sons and their daughters to other people groups who did not know the Lord, respect God, or worship God. They had opened that door. Now, some people have taken this passage and others like it to interpret that God is against interracial marriage. That is absolutely false. This is, an, is not about race. This is about religion. The people of God, the reason he called them Israel was because they were God-governed. They belonged to God as a people. God is the one who wanted them to uphold him as the one true and living God, to honor him in such a way that he could bless them in such a way that the world would see that there's no God like the God of the Jews. That's why he wanted them separate. Not because it's wrong to marry somebody of a different race. That's not at all the picture. Even though many have drawn that conclusion, they're wrong. It's that we should not give our children to a spouse for them that does not know the Lord. And more, really, more accurately in our culture, our young people should never marry someone who does not know the Lord, who is not equally yoked. Make sense? Well, I don't know if it makes sense or not, so let me take you to chapter, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14 through 18. You can just go ahead if you will, and you could write that down if you want. 2 Corinthians 6, 14 through 18. This is what the Scripture says. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. Or another way of saying it in the Scripture is, don't be bound together with unbelievers. Do not marry someone who's not a believer in God. Verse 14, the latter part of the verse, for what partnership, now he takes like four times, he describes in different ways the difference between somebody who walks with God and somebody who does not. He said, for what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Remember when Jesus said in Matthew 7, not everybody who says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, on the day of his return, many will say, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not cast out demons? Did we not do many miracles? And I will say to them, I never knew you. Listen, depart from me, those of you who practice lawlessness. A person who loves God wants to live by the law of God. They want to live by the word of God. If you marry somebody and you have a heart for God and you want to live your life to bring glory to his name and to expand the kingdom of God through your gifts and your abilities and your time and your energy, listen, and you marry somebody who their focus is on NASCAR, their focus is on shopping, their focus is on all these other things and they get caught up in and they have zero desire to put energy and effort in serving and worshiping God. That's what he's referring to. Do not be unequally yoked. Don't be unequally yoked. What partnership has righteousness and lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light and darkness? They're completely opposite. Darkness represents wickedness. Light represents righteousness, goodness. 
Why would you marry somebody who doesn't have the light of Christ in their heart? Verse 15, what, a, what accord has Christ with Belial? Now he compares Jesus to Satan. Why, why would you join Jesus to Satan? It can't happen. Neither should it happen with you. You say, well, my, the, the, the person that I want to date, they might not be a Christian, but they're not Satan. They belong to Satan. You say, no, they, what makes you say, that sounds, man, you're just so, you're so close-minded. No, listen, it's real simple. You either love God or you are of this world. And Satan is the prince of this world. Whether you like it or not, if you have not given your heart to Christ, you're not of him, you are of Satan. You are literally being carried out the, the, the will of Satan on this earth. Don't marry someone like that. He goes further. Or what, what portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? What agreement has the temple of God with idols? They're so different. For we are the temple of the living God. As God said, I will make my dwelling among them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore, go out from their midst. Listen now, verse 17. Go out from their midst, from the world, and be separate from them. Separate there in the original Hebrew actually speaks of holy. Become holy. The world cannot become holy. Holy. Only the Holy Spirit who resides in the heart of a believer can make a person holy before God. And God says, I want you to separate from the world. Now, that doesn't mean you don't have any fellowship with the world. My goodness, you work with people in the world, and you work together with them. You can go into business with somebody in the world. You can play on the same ball team together with people from the world. But when it comes to advancing the kingdom of God... They can't. Why would you align with them? They're not going in the same direction you're going. And he says, and, uh, and don't touch any unclean thing. Then I will welcome you, and I will be a father to you, and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. Now, I want to say this. Those, some of you are married to someone who's not a believer. That's behind you now. You can't go back and fix that. And God's not trying to condemn you in that just now at this point you live your life in such a way to be salt and light in your home to your spouse you love them with the love of jesus christ even though they don't even believe in jesus so that's that's your role it, it, it's not to go back and let satan beat you up because you didn't make the right choice god can change any human being who doesn't know him and he wants you to be a witness of him he will use that to reach your spouse for the Lord. And that's what you want. Okay? So it's not a racial thing. It's a religious thing. When you have made the Lord your trust and your spouse has a different trust, you are actually unequally yoked. So come out from among them in matters of kingdom work, the work of God. We, can't, we can be together again on certain things. If, if there's a hurricane and our community is devastated by the hurricane, and FEMA comes in with water, uh, we, we, we'll go out and we'll line up next to the pagan, and we will pass water to those who are in need. We will, we will work together, right? But when it comes to advancing the kingdom of God, no, we can't. They're not, they're not on the same page. We should pray for them, we should love them, and we should share the gospel with them. That's what we do. So number two, we'll, we will keep God in our business dealings, not just in how we choose for our, our children a spouse or in our day how our children choose a spouse, but now we will keep God in our business dealings. Look at verse 31. And if the peoples of the land bring in goods or any grain on the Sabbath day to sell, we will not buy from them on the Sabbath or on a holy day. So they had been doing that. Now they're saying we're going to stop. We will forego the crops of the seventh year and the ex and ex and exaction of every debt. So the Sabbath was to be kept holy. It was a day of rest, not a day of work, not a day of going out and making money. This was the Jews. This is not the case today because Christ 
paid the perfect price on the cross for our sins, and He and He alone has justified us in the eyes of God, and it's by faith in Him. He is the Lord of the Sabbath. He said that of Himself, that He's the Lord of the Sabbath, which means this, He resides in my heart. Every day I have rest in the Lord. I can take rest anytime I choose. Jesus is with me 24-7, amen? That's better than just having one day a week that you rest. We can rest with Jesus anytime, any way. And we can remain holy before the Lord because the Spirit of God is in us conforming us to the image of Jesus. So that's what he's speaking of here. The foreigner would say, there's money to be made on the Sabbath, And they would come to town, to Jerusalem, and they would set up their wares, and the Jews would come out and buy from them. And then the Jews would set up their wares, and the foreigners would buy from them. They were making money on the Sabbath. But the law said, don't do it. Don't be about greed on the Sabbath. Don't be about income on the Sabbath. The Sabbath is your reminder that God is the one who provides for you. You say, yeah, but I'm missing out on a day of work that I can make money. God can't make up the difference. God can't come to you and love you and bless you and encourage you and help you in ways that go beyond money. In our day, we're not commanded not to work on a specific day. That's not true. But we are commanded that we would walk in Christ. Amen? That means every day I'm listening to what he's saying. That means that I stop. Here's what they were doing that was wrong, that was sinful. They had taken, they had removed the opportunity to honor God in their business dealings. What they were doing by working on the Sabbath was not honoring to God. We too can do the same thing in our business dealings, the way we conduct our business. Our business practices either honor God or they don't. We need to make sure as God's people today that when the Holy Spirit convicts us about something in our workplace that we would stop and allow God to be the victor and trust God rather than trusting in man or trusting in ourselves and our ability to make the money that we make. Listen, you want to trust God. God will never fail. There's never been a day, listen, that God's owed us anything. He is not one that's indebted to us. He will always provide for us. We need to trust him that way. And that is what he's calling the people here to do. Number three, picking up at verse 32, but number three is we will be faithful to give to the work of the Lord. Verse 32, we also take on ourselves the obligation to give yearly a third part of a shekel for the services of the house of our God, for the showbread, the regular grain offering, the regular burnt offering, the Sabbaths, the new moons, the festivals. They had seven major festivals every year. The appointed feasts, the holy things, and the sin offerings to make atonement for Israel and for all the work of the house of God. We're going to be faithful to carry out our obligation that was clearly laid out in the law. Now, you and I are not living under the Old Testament law. But Paul gives us with clarity what giving looks like in the New Testament for the church. That giving should be regular it should be consistent. It should be keeping in keeping with what we bring in. So we each week say, Lord, this week I was able to bring in. How would you like me to give this week? It shouldn't be that every week it's the same number, unless every week you have the same amount coming in. This is what God calls, and that it should be given with, with generosity and cheerfully. I heard of one church that they would say, we're going to, you know, they'd pass the offering plates in the service. And they'd say, it's, now it's time to, to take the offering, to receive our tithes and offerings. And the people would go, woo! Cheerful giving. Why didn't you guys like that? <laughs> Nobody was grinning on that, you know? But that's what the New Testament calls for. 
Be cheerful in your giving to God. Faithful, trustworthy, consistent, regular, proportionate in your giving to God. Now, the people gave annually a temple tax consisting of a third of a shekel. That tax covered necessities for the feasts and the sacrifices. They also cast lots to see whose turn it was to bring the wood to the temple that would be used for the burnt offerings. And so everybody had responsibilities to God through the temple because the temple in the Old Testament was where God lived. That's where his presence dwelt in the Holy of Holies. Remember Moses when they had the tent of meeting, the tabernacle, and all the people would set up their, their, their tents around the, the tent of meeting in the middle. And you would see Moses walking down through the path, you know, of all the tents, and you'd look up and you'd see a cloud that had descended over the tabernacle as Moses would go in and spend time with God. The people saw, they knew that the temple represented the presence of God. It's different now. This, is, this church building is not the temple of God. The temple of God is in your heart. We are the temple of God. The Holy Spirit dwells within us. I don't need to go to a location to have the presence of God like in the Old Testament. Now, Christ is in me, the hope of glory. The Holy Spirit resides in me. And every second of every day, God is with me. He's present with me. So now we're released from these types of responsibilities based on the temple. But we're not released. So what, what role does this church play? What role does this worship center play? Well, before I get there, let me just share something else. If you look further down, look at verse 35. We obligate ourselves to bring the first fruits of our ground, the first fruits of all of our, uh, every tree, year by year to the house of the Lord. Also to bring to the house of our God, to the priest who minister in the house of our God, the firstborn of our sons and of our cattle, as it is written in the law, and the firstborn of their herds and of their flocks. And, and to bring the first of our dough and our contributions, the fruit of every tree, the wine, the oil, the priest, to the chambers of the house of our God. That's, we bring it all to the priest. By the way, Israel, in this period of time, under God's theocracy, God ruled, God set up a taxation system for Israel. Guess what the taxation number was? Some of you say, oh, it had to be 10%. No, it was 26% annually to cover all these things. When it speaks in Malachi of you've robbed God with a, with a tenth, he's speaking of specifically a tithe that went to the temple to care for the poor and to provide for the, the supplies. But there were many other things that Israel had to provide for the seven feasts and other things. So a total of 26% that they gave to the Lord annually. So verses 32 through 34, it addresses how they will honor God in making their money. But in verses 35 through 37, it reveals how they will honor God in their giving. One is how I get income. The other is how I release that income. They're making a covenant for both sides. Have you made a covenant before God for how you will receive your income with sound ethical business practices so that people in the workplace see that you are a believer. You're different. You're not like the world. And then what do you do with the resource that comes in? Have you made an obligation to be faithful to God in his work? See, now it's not just giving money for the sake of a building because God's presence dwells. By the way, this building is not the church. You, the people, are the church, right? But we gather here as the church on this site every week and through the week, we have Bible studies and groups that come out. That's what this building is for, for the assembly of God's people. And so we do need to give to upkeep the, the, the building. We need to give to pay off the debt that we have now because we own a building. It's wonderful to, who, 
and holler about how wonderful this is, but we do have a debt we need to pay off. And so we, but how does that get paid? By our faithful giving to God. But here's the beautiful thing. But it's not limited to giving in church on Sunday. All week long, the Holy Spirit who lives in you is, is speaking to you about being a blessing to people. Find ways to love others, to bless them. Give beyond what you've ever given before to minister to people, to help people. It's amazing what happens to you. I had somebody who came to me years ago, and they were just a curmudgeon. They were just so down on everything, you know. You're, people who are down on everything are never up on anything. And that was this type of person. And they, they said, you know, there's this problem, there's this problem, and this over here in the church, and I wish this would happen, and this isn't happening. And I said, hey, let me, let me suggest something to you. I want to ask you to go out this week and buy a dozen roses. And I want you to go to the nursing home. And I want you to walk the halls and go into the rooms, and I want you to hand a rose to the patients that are in those wards and ask them if you can pray for them. Listen to what their prayer request is and then pray for them. That person actually did it. And you know what they learned? They learned that when they became givers and put others first and focused, it changed their own attitude. They no longer griped and complained to me all the time. It's amazing how quick we are to navel gaze. I'm looking here. We're singing our theme song, Woe is me, when we ought to make it about others. Sharing the gospel with people, loving people where they live, ministering to people, helping the widow, helping the single parent mom, helping those who cannot do for themselves. Oh, there's so many opportunities every day that we can share with others. Amen? This is the church. This is what God has called the church to. This is what we ought to be about. So now what is this church? What is this facility? What is it about? Let me tell you what. First and foremost, it's about the worship of God. We come for one reason, not to lift up and elevate the name of man. We come to worship the one true and living God. Amen? That's why we hold worship the worship of song, the worship of studying the word, the worship of praying together. These are things that are important to worship. We do those things every week. Secondly, we want to come and we want to be a blessing to the body of Christ. And while we're being a blessing, we need a blessing. You can go into the world and be faithful to God and come back beat up and wounded, and you need the body to encourage you to comfort you, to pray for you, to strengthen you with the truth of God's word. We need that from week to week. So the loving of the one another's, first God worshiping him, secondly loving one another. And then the third purpose of this church and, this, and the use of this building and the people that gather is that we would become a blessing to the world. Later this month, I'm excited, we're going to have another missionary come Brother Pastor Isaac Shaw, who was with us and preached a dynamic message. What was that, February or March? He was with us. <clears throat> Powerful sermon. He's coming back at the end of this month to preach again. To compel us to go into the world and preach the gospel. We're looking as elders <clears throat> at an opportunity to go over to uh, uh, India, northern India, and experience <clears throat> the ministry that we support there that, that Brother Isaac Shaw is the director of. And we'll spend a few days there and observe and then come back and put together a team of people. We think that the first trip will be a medical trip. Doesn't mean you have to be a doctor or a nurse. We need grunts too. People who just carry out moving things. But we, it's for those who can go over and minister to the people in the villages of India. We want to be about the world. We want to be a church that not only has a heartbeat on the local needs in our community, but also has a global perspective. 
that we see that God is doing a work around the world and he wants us to be part of that, that church in the world. Amen? This is, these are the three things. Worship God, love one another, encourage, inspire, hold accountable one another in the word. And then thirdly, let's get out there and let's sow seed. Let's throw the seed that the word of God might be heard, that the gospel would be preached and people would be saved. That's what we're about. That's what we're about. And by the way, going, listen, throwing money to a missions organization is not the answer. It's one way to give, and we do it that way. But the other thing is that we would speak to people face to face. Every one of us making connection points with this world. We will train you. We're going to take time to train on how to share the gospel with people. Let me ask you a question. How many of you were saved by God because of something you saw on TV or on Facebook or some other social media? Raise a hand if you were saved by God through any of those venues. Raise a hand. Yeah, raise it high if that's you. One. That's all I see is one hand. Okay, here's another one. How many were saved by God because of a radio broadcast or a podcast of a sermon? A downloaded sermon. How many of you were saved by that? That form of, of venue or men, media? No hands. How many of you were saved because, by God because someone modeled Christ before you and they spoke to you about God and the gospel? Raise your hand. Look around. Look around. No excuses, church. That is the way God wants us to live our lives, sharing the gospel. Amen? So that's what we're here for. That's what we're committing to. This is where our commitment to the Lord is, that we would put him first in our worship, that we would love one another and not become a church filled with dissension and, and faction, and thirdly, that we would go out and share the gospel in the world and then come back in here and get our wounds licked. You know, we need to heal up a little bit because each week we go right back out and do it again and again and again. Our brothers and sisters in India and other parts of the world, that's what they're doing every week. We need to join them. By the way, that's not their work. That's God's work. They're just joining God. And God is calling us to join him as well. So new building, wonderful. A place to come to be restored in our worship of God a place where we can love one another and a place where we're sent out every week to go and tell others what we've been learning in here. Amen? Amen. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, I want to tell you that the only way that can happen is if the Holy Spirit were to draw you. And if he's drawing you, you are sensing even right now in this place that God is calling you unto salvation. And it is the Holy Spirit who does that work of salvation. It's not you. It's not by how good you are. It's not by your merit. It's not by your reputation. It's not by your credibility with people. It's by the work of God. All you bring to the table is a broken down vessel. And God says, I want to build that vessel for my glory. If you're feeling that, you're sensing that, then just call out to God. Confess that you're a broken sinner. Confess that you want to repent of your sin. You want to turn back to God like the Israel. They said, we're going to make a covenant. We're going to turn back to God. Just confess, repent, and you'll be saved, Scripture says. What a beautiful thing that is. And we want to have a baptism service and celebrate your salvation. If you haven't been baptized, we want to baptize you if you know the Lord. If you've been saved, we want to baptize you. Amen. I don't know where we're going to do it, but we'll do it. Amen. We got an old pond out behind. It's a retention thing, and it looks kind of swampy when there's water in there, but it'll be a step of faith, you know, to go in that water. But hey, I want us to close by taking communion. And I think going back to what we just said is so important, and that is that we're not like the Old Testament Jews in the sense that we do things in order to abide by God's law. The Old Testament law was a tutor for the New Testament Christian. 
It is to teach us that we can never be good enough. And so Christ comes and he lives the law to the letter. He fulfills the law. He's still fulfilling the law. We don't have to fulfill it. We can't fulfill it. We're not good enough to fulfill it. But we, by faith, trust in the one who has fulfilled it. Amen? Communion is not something we do because every time we do it, we're saved again. Or God is pleased with me. And I feel like I'm in a better place than I was before communion. That is not biblical. That is not what the doctrine of salvation teaches in the Bible. We don't take communion for it to change us. We take communion to remember what Christ has done for us. Past tense, done. It's not about you doing. It's about what Christ has done. All of your doing is do-do. Only Christ can fulfill perfection before God the Father. And he has done that. And by faith, by grace through faith, you can receive it and be saved. Communion is for the believer. If you're not saved, we're not wanting you to come forward and partake. Don't do that. It's okay to not come. Nobody's going to look down upon you for not coming. I just appreciate you being honest about it. But for those who have received Christ as their Savior, they come forward and they receive the elements for one reason, to be reminded, I've been saved by God. The covenant was made in that cup, what it represents, the blood of Jesus, the cutting of the covenant. And I'm going to partake, not because that blood or that representative of blood saves me, but because it reminds me that the covenant was made by Jesus for me before God. Isn't that wonderful? Wow. So if the ushers would come and prepare the tables, how we normally do this, and now we're in a new building, but it's the same way. And in just a second, I'm going to allow you to come forward through the center aisle so everybody comes across. By the way, do you appreciate that the rows are a little further apart so you have room to move between the rows? So come to the center aisle, starting in the front. Come down. This section will come to this side, this section over here. Go walk by, receive the elements, and then go back the outside aisle to your row and go through and have a seat. And we'll partake together after everyone has been served. Okay? Um, I want to pray before we partake. Okay? Father, thank you so much for your love and thank you for this service, the first service in this new structure. It's new to us. And I thank you, Lord, for your people who invested time and energy to serve you, to fulfill the will of God for Vero Bible Fellowship, and all of us partake together in that. Now, Father, we know that it's not about buildings. It is about the relationship that we have with you through Christ. So we turn our affections toward the elements of communion that Jesus established in our behalf, that we would take this bread and we would eat of it knowing it is his body that was put on the cross, suffered and died for our sinfulness. It was his blood that was shed that we might be found forgiven of all of our sins, both past, present, and future. We thank you, Lord. Change our hearts, God, right now. Just check us at the door that our hearts would be right as we come. This would not just be a routine thing. This would be a moment of clarity. We would understand what Christ has done and then come and receive these elements. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.